Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. You are listening to the Gospel Addict Podcast. We call this the Gospel Addict Podcast because we believe the gospel or the good news of Jesus is the best news ever. And it's not just the ABCs of the Christian life. It's the A to Z of the Christian life. In other words, the gospel is the key to everything. On this episode, I'm joined with my good friend and co-host, Randy Nickel, and together we are going to interview Tom Petersburg. Tom gives leadership to Catapult Ministries, but has previously served as a staff member of Crew and Athletes in Action for 40 years. Eight years in campus ministry, 32 years as a chaplain to professional sports teams in Cleveland, Ohio. Although the majority of his career was focused on discipling athletes and equipping them to utilize their platform, his ministry extended to coaches, businessmen, and ministry leaders. Today, I'm hoping that uh, that together we can talk about the power of the gospel and how it how it changes lives and and also gospel driven discipleship. I'd like to ask Tom to share some tips to more effectively disciple others. And Randy and I will both ask Tom questions, but let me start by officially welcoming you to the show, Tom, and ask if there's anything else you'd like to add in terms of introduction and maybe briefly share how the gospel has changed your life. Well, it's really changed my life, obviously, as I, I became a Christian uh, my senior year in high school. I grew up in a church <clears throat> where I heard the gospel uh, very often. I heard altar calls. I heard evangelists. And yet it was at a, a youth camp in South Dakota where I clearly heard from some college students whose lives have been changed by the gospel how well they know Jesus. And my experience was I was just supposed to be a good person. And I, I kind of rated my life as to how happy I was or <clears throat> how good my circumstances were. And, uh, and yet I had to admit that my joy really was dependent on, on my circumstances. And so that was a turning point for me in high school that I knew for the first time that as I gave my life to Christ, he came into my life. And I, I grew very slowly in those early years, uh, first couple of years. And then I I ended up being involved with uh, Campus Crusade at Iowa State University and some of the other men around me, roommates, uh, guys with the ministry there began to give some um, time into my own life and growth and and uh, things took off from there and then began to sense that God called me to ministry. So it's uh, uh, I was very fortunate to start at a younger younger time in my life. Well, and it's obvious that God really got a hold of your life because you've dedicated the last 40 years of your life to serving him, and which is exciting. Randy, you want to talk about your relationship with Tom? And <clears throat> Well, uh, I've known Tom for many years. I moved back to Cleveland. I was on staff with Young Life, moved back to Cleveland and got involved in this group of folks that were planting an evangelical free church on the west side of Cleveland. And it was there that I met Tom for the first time. And um, I'll just say this, that Tom is someone I respect, but Tom is also someone uh, whose name you hear around Cleveland. He's just someone who has impacted many in their lives in Christ. And Tom, I've always appreciated your wisdom. And when I'm stuck on something, every once in a while, he'll get a call from me just saying, hey, am I thinking straight on this? Or um, So, Tom, I, I appreciate you and your ministry and your family. And uh, I, yeah, it's just an honor to be on here with you. Well, thanks. It has been a, a fun run as we've been involved in church and various ministry things together. So, Tom, I was recently with you um, at a meeting and you were sharing some tips on discipling, which I thought were really, really interesting. Maybe we just kind of dive in there. Um, can you can you begin to share some of those some of those thoughts? Yes, we, we looked at a couple of things that that I find um, I, I find myself 
working through in ministry in these later years in ministry and life. I, I find these are common issues as I work with disciplers. Um, for many years, I've discipled men, but more of my focus now is on those men who want to learn how to disciple and mentor others. Uh, one of the things that has stuck out for several years for me is this issue of our culture is so dependent and so respectful of experts. And I've even found that as an older person involved in discipleship, the younger guys that I've discipled or pulling, I'm pulling into discipleship kind of feel like they have to become an expert to disciple somebody else. And it is so far from the truth. I, I, I think that we need to grow and learn in being a discipler, but um, in the scriptures, you find even Paul uh, referred to his disciples within weeks after he came to Christ uh, in the book of Acts. And so I, I find that the younger guys that realize they need to be a learner rather than an expert are the guys that pick up discipleship quite quickly. Uh, we are merely passing on what, what we're learning currently, um, not just what we've gathered in the early days of our walk with God, but it's fresh and it's current. And so I, I think that sometimes we've stifled people from moving into discipleship and they think they've got to be an expert. And rather, we just need to be a learner. I like that. And you talked about, you shared this illustration, which I thought was so cool, about how we learn. And uh, you, you talked about like riding a bike. Can you, can you share that? Yeah, this was a funny illustration that hit me just a year ago. I was, I was reading some things and came across an article on kids learning to ride bikes. And most of us grew up with trainer wheels on a bike, and they allowed us to tip about two inches either way. And um, you really didn't learn to ride a bike until dad took the trainer wheels off. So how they're teaching kids, according to this article today, to ride a bike is they don't put the trainer wheels on at all, but they lower the seat low enough so that the the child can keep both his feet on the ground. And as he sits on that seat and he uses his legs to, rather than pedal, he propels himself by kind of running along the ground. He learns to balance the bike. And then he begins to go, I bet I can go 10 feet without using my feet. And, and it's just this natural inclination to, to do better without my feet on the ground. And so before long, the child has learned how to balance the bike, raise the seat, now he's using the pedals. And in many ways, discipleship is the same way. I think you can learn so much from good discipleship books, but you don't really learn it until you begin meeting with somebody. And then it has such an impact on your own life and what you're learning and what you're trying to figure out and find answers to his questions that together you become learners. And, and I, I look back at my 40, 50 years of discipling men and some of my strongest guys that are still having a ministry today in their retirement years are guys that I discipled when I didn't know much. It wasn't that I knew what I was doing. It's that together we were learning what it meant to walk with Jesus. What, what is this relationship all about? And so to me, that's kind of exciting. And, and I think that young disciples need to experience that. Of, of you don't have to know it all. You can easily say, that's a great question. I'll, let's go see if we can find the answer. I love that. So basically, part of your message here is that if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are ready to disciple someone else. Yeah. Now, I still need those older believers around me to keep me on track. I mean, I, I, I don't want to become arrogant to think, well, I got it down now. I've known Jesus for a year and a half. And, and I start teaching them some, you know, things off the wall a bit. And so I think there's where the, the value of being in a church where there are other disciples where you say, hey, I'm meeting with uh, Joe. What, what do you think I should be covering with him? And, you know, Joe is struggling with these issues. Help me. What, what can we, where can we go in the scriptures to resolve some of this or help him get his feet on the ground? So I do think there's the great value of this camaraderie. And, and I think Randy would say the same thing, that we both walk through a lot of ministry that way, that. We books are great help. Other people's uh, writings and sermons are great, but we really benefit from one another here. Uh, Tom, a book I know that's impacted our church and impacted us. I know that we've used it with some guys at church is a book called The Way of the Alongsider by Bill Mowry. And um, what I love about that, it, it really broken down, is that it's not complicated. 
we tend to make this thing so complicated. And really this idea of that we come alongside somebody, uh, I think a big part of the job of a discipler is to encourage that as we learn, we're encouraging those to come along with us. When Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so I love when you shared that. And when you shared that at the meeting that Greg and I were at with you, that was the first thing I thought of is that it, this is really not as complicated as we make it. it it's uh, if, if you know how to be a friend, if you know how to care for somebody, you can come alongside them and, and encourage them and walk with them in Christ. It really is way of life. I, I remember sitting in a Sunday school class at our church when we were quite small. And there were maybe 20 people in the class. And I said, um, I, I think we're studying 2 Timothy on discipleship. And I, and I said to the, to the group, think back to who's had the impact on your life. And right away, everybody's talking. And they're, they're, they're listing a woman or a man that, that ran alongside him in high school or college or early professional years. And there's an older guy in the room. He's probably in his, I shouldn't say he's older. He's about 50 years old. He's in the room and he said, oh, no. And this look of surprise is on his face. And he goes, that guy was discipling me. <laughs> he just realized that this guy who was just living the Christian life with him was really intentionally discipling him. I love that. I love that. And I, I experienced that as a young believer the guy who helped bring my older brother to Christ, KP, he not only came and discipled my brother, but he kind of discipled me um, even before I was a Christian. Um, but, and, and I can remember when I joined the Navigators, I heard this Navigator guy speak, and I can't think of who it is. I can't give him the credit because I can't remember who it is. But he said to do three things, share your life, share God's word, and pray together. And as I look back at what KP did with me, that's kind of what he did. He he just he he shared his life, he shared God's word with me, and he prayed prayed to, prayed with me. And uh, it was simple, but it was it had a profound impact. He used to drive an hour and fifteen minutes one way to come and spend an hour with me between classes when I was at Kent State University. And I just look back on that. And I'm like amazed that he did that, but he, he was investing in my life. And I, to this day, he's one of my spiritual heroes and I'm so grateful for the investment he made. And it also, what you're saying also reminds me of, um, you know, the three important relationships a discipler should have. We should all have a Paul, somebody that we can go to, like you said, that can say, Hey, what should I do next? Or, or, you know, how can I help this person? A Paul and then a Timothy, you know, somebody that we're investing in, but then we need a Barnabas too, like so, an encourager, somebody who's can just kind of encourage us along the way. Those, those three relationships are important in, in a discipling relationship. Well, you, you also, if, unless you want to share anything more on this point, let's move, move on to the, the second thing you shared uh, related to the culture about yes. secondhand learners. Yes. I think that much of our uh, younger generations today are growing up in what I would call their, their secondhand learners. We have been incredibly blessed by books, sermons, blogs, access to anything out there with the internet. I mean, you can, you can pick up any sermon on any topic. You can go to websites dealing with any issue from a Christian perspective, found tremendous material. So we're incredibly blessed by that. But I think one of the things, and I've, I've heard other pastors verbalize the same thing, that too often we become reliant on what someone else has studied and, and sorted through. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so we become secondhand learners. We, we're, we're taking all this material and sometimes at the expense of our own discovery in the scriptures. Um, and again, I can't, I can't emphasize enough how valuable the resources we have are today. But too many people have missed out on the great joy of discovering the truths of the scriptures for themselves. And mm. so I find that in discipleship, a good share of my time is spent in helping people understand an Old Testament survey, a New Testament survey, 
I've seen Randy do this often with uh, young guys and teaching them how to have a devotional life. What does it mean to have time with God each day? And what do you do when you're in the scriptures? What are ways to approach the scriptures? And I just find that one of the greatest things we can do in discipleship is help them become a firsthand learner. I, I used the illustration with you men and, and women that one morning we were together that I've been to the, the Smoky Mountains, I've been to the Rocky Mountains many times for a couple of weeks at a time. And I could bring back a thousand pictures and within a half an hour, you'll be bored. And they're wonderful pictures. They, they give me great memories and, and I can picture these things and I can feel what it was like to be there. But you don't. You don't know what, what it sounds like for the wind to come through those mountain ranges or the late afternoon storms come up and how the atmospheric pressure changes and you can feel the storm and the, 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 the magnitude of the thunder and the little um, squirrels uh, running around in the brush. You, I can't capture that in the picture. And for me to, to work with a person who is just a secondhand learner, he's just working with my photographs. Mm. But the joy in his life when he realizes going to the scriptures, the magnitude that's there, the, the character of God, the emotion of God, the way the passages are written, he, he needs to be taught how to look for the things in the scriptures. And that makes him a firsthand learner. And it, and it propels his walk with God. That's excellent. You remind me of, you know, one of the things Jesus did. He was with the disciples, being with them, being with them, experiencing life together and, uh, you know, experiencing God's word with another person is a powerful thing to, to do it with them. And you made this comment about uh, not that you're against devotionals because I'm, you know, um, but that, you know, devotional can be encouraging but it doesn't mature people the way firsthand learning does. Yeah. And so many people, we just, so many Christians, we just rely on devotionals. What other people say about God's word rather than going to it ourselves. And that, that is a, that is an excellent uh, reminder. I mean, for years in my early Christian life, that's what I did. I, I read devotionals. And I would, I would read them for a, couple, a week and then I'd get bored. You know, like the best ones were like the first couple ones. And then all of a sudden I, lo I would lose interest. And so I'd go buy another devotional. Yeah. But when I, was, when I turned 30 years old, I made a commitment. I decided, you know what? I'm just going to read God's word. And so I made a commitment to read through the Bible every year, uh, Lord willing, for the rest of my life. And that has been so enriching. Um, and... <laughs> And what I realize is you can't, you, you can never conquer the Bible. The Bible is so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it never gets old. Yeah. Every, every year I read, I'm reading the same passages, but they hit me in a different way. And so that, so that's really good. Randy, you have any, any, anything you want to yeah. say? I, I just want us to be careful that people don't misunderstand. I think, I, I think, and Tom, I, if I can, I think your point is that, that we're called to be learners ourselves and not just uh, eat what somebody else has regurgitated, someone else has digested and then given to us, but that we learn for ourselves. But when we say devotional, like I know our devotional life, it's not, to me, it's not just reading and studying the Bible, which are crucial, but the part of the, about the devotional life is intimacy is that are we communing with God? Are we spending time with him each day? That our goal isn't just for people to learn knowledge, but to learn that God wants to spend time with them. And so I, I think um, my friend Dane Alphen shared with me once that in a survey taken among Christians over decades, of all the things that Christians do, of all the disciplines, things like fellowship and worship and and prayer and study, Bible reading, all of those are important. They're all great. But he said the one that seemed to have the greatest impact in seeing people's lives transformed were people that set up a time where they spent time reading God's word every day. That that seemed to be the thing that began to change people. Maybe it changes the way we think, but when we spend time with Christ, it, it begins to change us. So I, I totally agree with Tom's point. I just want us to be careful that when we say devotional, that um, some people think, well, 
Now, our encouragement is that you do spend time with Jesus every day. However, uh, it, it's you spending time in, in God's word and learning and God speaking to you. Not And reading what someone else has read isn't a bad thing. It's just, it can't be your only thing, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that um, maybe we should use the term devotional material. Um, you know, I, I, I need this quick quote on my mind as I go to class today or as I head into my work that might give me some encouragement and, and then they miss out on really being in the scriptures. I, I point out a guy in particular. I, I look back at Travis Hafner, a guy who played for the Indians for several years, finished his career with the Yankees, came to Christ as he left baseball, both he and his wife. And uh, when I met him, he was about a year, I met up with him again. He'd come back up to Cleveland for a summer. And, and um, he'd been a Christian about a year, and he was just finishing reading the Bible, the whole scriptures for himself. And I think, well, I, I can probably count on my hand how many times I've ever met a person like that. And here was a guy that um, he was not necessarily a guy that was drawn to books or reading or anything like that before, but he was captured by God's word. And I would say that uh, he's known Christ now for about nine years, and he's read the scriptures every year. And it's kind of his goal in life that anybody he meets with, he gets them on his reading plan. And they're in the scriptures together. Um, so I, th there's exciting things that happen when we get time with God in his word that, uh, that can't be matched. That's great. Well, I think you had a couple other things that uh, tips you, you, you shared. Um, was the next one related to foundation? Yeah, a little bit. We talked or about lordship. lordship. We talked about lordship. Second Timothy two two, which is a common verse in discipleship, uh, that Paul is uh, pushing Timothy a little bit. The things you've heard from me, Timothy, pass on to faithful men who will teach others. So you've got four generations there. And sometimes um, uh, what we need for the real meat of that is to go to the following verses, where he talks about the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. And, and those words have to do with the, the, the nature of our commitment to God, especially the soldier, which is about lordship, that he is the one I report to. He's the one who calls the shots in my life. And I think that, um, that in, the, in different generations understand the scriptures differently or they grab on to what it means to, that Jesus is Lord. We live in such a consumerism uh, lifestyle today or um, a culture. And so I find that um, that, is a, that is a great topic to be aware of as I'm discipling men, that um, we need to keep coming back to this issue that not only do I have Christ, but he has me. I was transferred into his kingdom when I came to know Christ. I belong to him. And that changes the way I pray. That changes the way I serve. It changes my perspectives and how I view life. And um, so I just find that that's a real critical topic in discipleship uh, as we're around each other, just to keep our focus on this issue of God's in control. And therefore, I submit wholeheartedly to his kingship. You, you talked about the letter of First Thessalonians and how you did a deep study of it and some of the things you learned there. And even some of the commentaries you read, you felt like they, they, they missed the point. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that um, when you look at 1 Timothy, it's not a heavy doctrinal book. It's certainly not Romans or Ephesians or Colossians. And so I, I remember coming across one commentary that was kind of slighted the book of 1 Thessalonians and that it was kind of too early to expect much from Paul's writings. And yet, as you back up and look at the context, he's writing to a group of young believers and he's, he's giving them what they need in their growth. And he talks two or three times, and he writes two or three times of, I can hardly wait to get back to you to complete what's lacking in your faith. And he challenges them with sanctification, of becoming uh, more holy in my lifestyle. Uh, he talks to them about loving each other. And he, he compliments them for how, how much their faith has grown and how much their church has grown. And yet, this is a book of... Um, a great instruction for a pattern for discipleship. So what is it that Paul taught? And then you pick up so much of his love for them. His, his, his just intensity. He's, he's grieving that he'd been kicked out of town and he, he couldn't be with them. How are they holding up in the midst of persecution? 
So it's heavy on relationship. It's heavy on good content for young believers. It's kind of an exciting book when you look at it from discipleship as opposed to just what do I learn about doctrine? That's great. Yeah, because Paul was only there a couple of weeks, right? And he kind of got forced out of the out, out of that area. And so he was really desperate to want to help those young believers grow yes. in their faith. And I love First Thess 2 8, where he says, We were delighted not only to share the gospel with you, but our very lives as well. And that's another thing about you know uh, the power of discipleship is it's not just a course you go through. Uh, it's, it's not a program. It's a, it's a real, it's real life on life, you know, kind of, kind of ministry. Um, well, and then you're, the last thing you talked about was framework. And what do you mean by framework? When I talk about framework, I'm speaking in the sense of, uh, when, when I am involved in discipleship with a person, I, I begin with and I think most ministries do, with the foundational issues, God's love and forgiveness, how to be sure that I'm a, well, how do I know that I'm a Christian? What do the scriptures speak to that? How to, how to walk by the spirit, uh, how to grow, how to spend time in the scriptures, understanding God's character. So those are, I would, I would call those foundational things. They have to do with my relationship with Jesus. Beyond that, we often will branch off into a variety of topics, many times real good needs that a person has or things they need to touch on, whether it's family or relationships or parenting or uh, my time in church, uh, whatever it might be. But, but so often, I think discipleship can, can move a little bit too far in one direction and that it becomes about my behavior. What are my activities? What am I doing which there are things that are helpful there, especially the disciplines, prayer, Bible study, fellowship, sharing my faith. Um, but those, are, I call those the activities of the Christian life, but God never said to walk by Bible study. He said, walk by faith. Um, he, he, um, he, he doesn't say we live under fellowship. We live, we live under grace. And so I, I've, I've just noticed in recent years that, that, um, I wanted to be more careful that I'm not trying to turn a disciple into all the right behavior. Oh. I want him to be sensitive to God's spirit that he's convicted and becomes obedient. And so the means of living the Christian life are what I, what I have in the back of my mind is I'm talking about activities because from his time in the scriptures, I want him to know God well enough. He can trust him. I will only trust God to the extent I believe he's trustable or trustworthy. And so I want him to understand that he lives by grace. He's going to mess up. And here's how to deal with confession and forgiveness. And yet the great part is I stand, according to um, Romans 5, 1 and 2, I stand in grace. I don't get episodes of grace from God. I stand in his grace. I live in his grace. And so the more that he can grasp that, then the Christian life becomes one of this enjoyment of, of knowing and walking with God as opposed to being really careful I don't deviate anywhere and have everything right, which is a, which is a, a nice goal, but God will correct us. And, and so we live by faith, trusting when he does convict me, I'll obey him. And so I, I want the believer seeing the framework of the Christian life, which is faith, grace, obedience. And even in our discussion that morning together, one of the guys said, well, what about hope? What about faith? And I said, yeah, that would be a similar aspects. Um, and so I, th I think it's helpful for a believer as he grows to understand that, that God wants him to trust him, not just be careful. He never makes a mistake. Discipleship is inside out. Yes. It's not outside in, which a lot of times it's easier to go outside in to just, you know, you gotta, you gotta be reading your Bible every day. You gotta, all these, all these disciplines. And you can do those disciplines, but then inside you're not really changing, right. and that, that's why it's so important that, that that we we experience change from in the inside out. And I think that's the power of the gospel in a believer's life. I'll tell you guys, this was a huge thing in my life, and um, this whole concept. And I think when we think about coming to know Christ, when we begin our relationship with Him, 
we all realize we, we can't earn that. Our salvation is not on what we have done and it's what Christ has done for us. But I think there's a point for most of us, and I certainly was for me, where, okay, I didn't earn my salvation, but from this point on now, it's still all up to me. How, how hard I work, what I do. And, and I'm not saying as Christians that we don't, that obedience isn't always easy. It's, it's, it can be hard work. But the reality is we don't just, the gospel isn't just for the moment when we receive Christ for what our salvation and forgiveness for atonement, but it is for our daily living, that God's grace is always. And I just remember feeling like it. so much of my Christian life is about surrender. And um, yeah, that what does it mean to live by grace? Is this, um, my mom had this German work ethic that was, she could work all of us under the table, no question. And I just remember feeling like that was my Christian life that and but when I realized it's salvation is by grace, as is my Christian life is by grace. And it's a gift from him. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, do I listen and walk with the Holy Spirit every day? And it was uh, it was an eye opening moment. It was not about me just loving God, but it was about me allowing God to, to love me. So. Yeah, Randy, I think I, I think I totally agree with you in that so often we've we've attached grace to salvation, not not to growth. Uh, we we can only grow by growth. I forget who I read this quote recently. I forget who said it, but the comment was made that grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. And oh. and and I think that really resonates. I mean, I awesome. probably I probably won't grow much if I'm not in the scriptures. Yes, is it Second Peter three eighteen? Peter says, "Grow in grace." Yes, I like that. I like that whole idea. Grow in grace. And I think that's that's what being a gospel addict is all about. Well, uh, Tom, you have put together a really cool website that has all kinds of resources. It's first of all, share your website domain name, and then do you have a favorite ministry uh, resource on your website, or maybe a, a few of them? Uh, the website is called catapultministries.org. Um, they're really two, it's a simple website. I, we developed it just to post materials at, at our phase in life. We, uh, I don't have time to market and move things, uh, you know, and books and things like that. So they're all free downloads. Uh, any of the Bible studies there are PDFs and they're downloadable. You can just punch hole them put them in a folder and we designed it so that somebody said uh, you can meet with a guy and challenge him to discipleship or meet with me for eight weeks to go through some material and he doesn't have to wait for a few days to buy a book he can say go to the website download this pdf and we'll get started on monday and so we wanted to make it as simple and transferable as we could Um, the website has two parts to it influence and uh, some things studies in there there's one study in particular under influence that I, I, I love to see men go through. It's called Influencers in His Service. And it kind of walks through this aspect that as believers, God's providence has been active in our lives since we came to know him. Well, before we came to know him. And God has orchestrated events and situations and circumstances and relationships to mold us in the, into the people he wants us to be. And that gives us a platform to have influence in the world. And so we are not only objects of God's grace, we're also agents of his grace. So what does it mean that I can have an influence in others' lives? And it takes, takes you through uh, seven or eight weeks of studies. It takes you to a lot of passages to look up and for you to soak through those on your own. Um, again, I'm, af- I'm after firsthand learners. And so uh, I don't write a lot of material with each of those um, chapters as much as here's the passages you ought to look at and, and these are kind of the general direction you, you go. The other side of the website has to do with discipleship. And there's a lot of articles, if you will, or probably blogs uh, that are perspectives, but then there's resources. And the resources is probably the place we put most of our time. Um, the Probably the piece I enjoy the most is Set Your Foundation. And it is a um, 
kind of a beginning discipleship piece. It's similar to what the NABs have, what Crusade has, what InterVarsity, CBMC, all of these have materials. It's similar to that, but it's written a little differently. And that again, it's written for you to do the conclusions, for you to do the study and draw out what you see and understand. And I simply guide toward the end of it that keep you on track. There is a, um, a, um, a leader's study guide that goes with it. Um, my, my board kept saying, Tom, you need a study guide with this. And I said, yeah, but it won't be an answer guide. It will be what to expect in each of these chapters as you interact with people on these topics. And it's your basic foundational um, studies, God's love and forgiveness, how to study the Bible, um, uh, God's character, spiritual warfare, you know, things like that. Uh, and then there's another study called framework, which is what we just talked about, grace, faith, and obedience. Uh, probably two of my favorites are uh, two that I finished most recently. Um, I did a study on First Thessalonians, which is on discipleship, for those who want to look more at being a discipler in how, how I approach First Thessalonians. And again, it's a study for you to do on your own or with a small group. I think discussion is great in this one, too. And then I just, in the last month, uh, put one up there, which when I did my study in First Thessalonians, one of the commentators made a comment about, we've really neglected the word hope. And, and it's scattered throughout the scriptures, especially Psalm and the New Testament. And, and I said, well, I guess I'm, I'd be the first to raise my hand that in 50 years, I've not done my own study on hope. And it blew me away. It just, it was one of the funnest studies I've ever done. And it has so affected my life in my later years that what does it mean to live with hope? Hope for the next generation, hope for the gospel, hope for eternity. And so it's centered around the person of Christ, centered around a sovereign God. It's centered around salvation. What does hope have to do with salvation? And um, it's just, it just personally, it's been one of those studies that had real impact in my own life. So uh, the writer of Hebrews says, hope is the anchor of our soul. And so that's another, those are a few of the studies I, I, I really like on there. That's fantastic. Uh, speaking of hope, just uh, let's go down this rabbit trail a little bit. Um, you know, can you just talk about the difference between the English word hope and the biblical word hope? Because like in English, we are like, I hope it doesn't rain today. But the Bible, when the Bible talks about hope, it's different. Yes. We speak about hope in the sense it may or may not happen. Just your illustrations. We're going to the beach today. I hope it doesn't rain. Um, and, and so it's a wish, if you will. Hope in the New Testament and in Psalms is, is much more of a, of a confident expectation. Those are the two best words that I could find to define hope. It's a confident expectation. And it's really tied to faith in the sense you know that Christ is returning because you have faith. You believe what he said he would do in his return. Hope is this expectancy that he will. He's on his way. It, it can happen any day. God is returning for us. Or it's hope in eternity that, you know, not only do I believe I'm going to spend eternity in heaven, but that's what I'm banking on. This is, this is my hope. This is, this is when the, the market goes all over the place and government goes wacko and everything is coming unglued in our country. No, my hope is in heaven and it's stable and it's unchanging. And this is what I expect that God is going to unfold fold in his time and his way. And so hope changes our perspective. It, 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 um, it feeds our faith, if you will. It, it, it's the, the, the excitement, the sense of anticipation that it's going to happen. But, I, but let me add to that, that there's a word that's used interchangeably with hope in the book of Psalms, and often it's the word wait. They're both translated from the same word often. Mm -hmm. And so in, in one of the Psalms, he says, it's like the watchman on the wall who waits for sunrise now, the thing is, he knows sun's coming up. He's a guard of that city, and, and he's nervous all night. But his hope is the sunrise is coming. And, and that's a picture of God's, um, God's promises. There is, there is sure is the sunrise. 
And so that becomes our expectancy because we do believe it. We do trust what he says. And so it, it's, it creates this sense of well-being, the sense of peace, the sense of somebody is in control. It doesn't matter how wacky our world gets. I have stability because of my hope. That's fat man. I love that. You know, one of the verses I've been meditating on this year is Romans 15, 13, which says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's got the word hope in there twice, Tom. Yes. Um, and I like it says the God of hope. He's a, he's the God of hope. Um, yeah. And how and does it, it reflect? How does it refer to an unbeliever, one who's not come to Christ yet? He is without hope in the world. That's, right. the, that's the distinguishing character. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. And man, I'll tell you, we're, we're living in a world. And I, I have always, ever since I've been a believer, I've always wondered how difficult it would be to live in this world as an unbeliever. Um, I'm just so thankful that that I know Christ and that, that God revealed himself to me. Okay. I want to shift gears again. Um, you have led devotionals for athletes. You know, you've probably led hundreds and hundreds, maybe over, maybe it's thousands. I don't, I don't know how many. I would love to hear the process you go through to design a devotional. Like, and, and are they like 10 minutes long or, and, what what was the process you go th go through? Because you've done so many of these, you must uh, you must have had some sort of process. It kind of varied with the team. With uh, the NBA, we'd have the two teams come together, and we had fifteen minutes. So I had twelve minute chapels with those those men. Um, and if they were late, a lot of teams would be fined a few hundred dollars. So you made sure you finished on time. Uh, with the Indians and the visiting uh, uh, baseball teams, uh, chapel is usually 20 minutes. And uh, with the NFL players, chapel is usually a half an hour, so a 25 minute message. So it really varied on length. Um, for me, I, I usually began with at least if I knew the team or I knew the like a visiting team I didn't know well, but the teams I work with, I usually started with what's going on in their lives. My my chapel services or messages had very little to do with the game. It, it had to do with life. It had to do with being an athlete in this environment. And it always came back to the scriptures and what, did it, what were they going to do with Jesus? And so sometimes it was evangelistic. A lot of times it wasn't. I, with the NBA, I had many times they'd have chapel at, before every game. So many weeks I'd meet with them twice a week. So... Uh, there are times I would be, I would simply go through a book in the scriptures, but I would pull out the things, I'd go through the book of Ephesians or the book of um, uh, Mark, and I would pull out the things that seemed to be pertinent to what they were experiencing in life, whether it was pressure or family or priorities or purpose. Um, and so I would just walk through a whole book so that they, in a sense, were spending more time in that one, that one book in the scriptures. It wasn't just a, a topic. Um, I do write some devotionals for athletes in action. I probably write 20 or 25 a year for their national web, international website. Um, I'd written a couple. I've been asked to write some. I wrote a couple and I said, these are, I want, I want the people in the scriptures, not your devotionals. And so they said, great, write your devotionals so they get into the scriptures, not our devotionals. And so again, I'll pick a topic, but I will, uh, I'll, probably take a verse apart. And then by the end of it, I'll ask them to go to the scriptures to look at a particular chapter. Do you have any favorite memories or experiences like um, whether it's a favorite devotional or maybe just an experience where um, it, something, you know, surprised you, you know, <laughs> you know, any, anything come to mind in, in all your years um, probably, um, I'd, I'd been with the pro ministry about 20, 25 years. And I did a message out of, with the Browns, I did a message out of, uh, um, Genesis 26 on Isaac. And it was on the topic of passivity. 
And I talked about that God has made us to be initiators, um, um, that we speak up, that we lead, that, that we were to be men who had an influence, and that passivity always moved us backwards in our, in our walk with God. God. God desires us to pursue him. He uses that word pursue. It's intentional. And so I went through that passage and used Isaac as an illustration of what his passivity got him in trouble with. I was shocked. I was literally shocked. I had more Christians and, and unbelievers stop me in the locker room every day the next week to say, man, I'm still thinking about that topic. Can I ask you a couple more questions? And here I'm, I'm dealing with men of violence. And, and we all assume these guys wouldn't be passive, but they're like the rest of us. A lot of them are very passive. They just know how to turn it on when they get on the field. That's violent uh, in terms of how they play the game. Uh, their games are not passive, but the, but they've reverted back to um, basically handing the the responsibilities, if you will, of their family over to their wives. And and too often, I mean, th these wives are amazing women. They sell houses, buy houses, move the family, and you know the guys on the road to the team. But too often in passivity, we've neglected our families and our responsibility there to lead and guide and protect and to engage with our kids in a certain way. Mm. And so I, I just, I hit a nerve that day. Uh, I will never forget that day and that week um, that caught me off guard. Um, and so it varies over the years of what some of the topics were. I, I, I use a lot of different businessmen and former athletes to speak and they kind of approach it the same way. Did you ever, did you ever make any mistakes? Like I'm, I'm sure you, you know, early on, like where you're like, Oh, you know, maybe, maybe you did talk too much about the game or um, anything come to mind, like with that, like, Oh man, I, I got to remember not to do that. Oh yeah. I, I think that so, so many times we can become too, knowledge oriented as opposed to life experience oriented. I, I, I've heard Randy speak a lot. This is one of Randy's gifts that, that he, he speaks to the heart. He speaks to the soul. And, and there are times I've, I would come out of a chapel and say, I would just speak into their heads today. I, I missed them. Uh, they didn't connect with me. Uh, I think that, that was often, I think the other thing is I'd find that I didn't process a, a, a a message long enough. I didn't pray through it long enough and let God kind of uh, cook and, 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 and reorganize what I needed to share with the men that day. Um, uh, you know, I thought it was interesting. One of the things you just talked about was uh, as men kind of uh, going after uh, pursuing things. That's really the, on your influencers, that's one of your studies, isn't it? Pursuers? Yes. Yeah, one of the one of the studies is called pursuers that we're to pursue our our mate, our spouse, and our master, um, our ministry, um, and so there, there are about six things in there that's that I go back to passages that God calls us to pursue, and that we shouldn't take passively, and they, they drastically do affect our growth and our walk with God. Um, I, I do know, Tom. I have examples. Uh, I'm friends with a few of the same people that Tom is, a couple of guys that played offensive line for the Browns, and their stories are stories of Tom pursuing them. Uh, one guy that Tom showed up at his house late night one night and uh, had an impact in his life. He challenged him that night, and uh, it, today he's in full-time ministry. And uh, it's just, I love the examples that you're doing the very thing you're writing about. So thank you. That's cool. Um, yeah, so any, any other, any other, uh, that, that, that was really cool. That story about Isaac, who would ever thought that, you know, a story about in, out of Genesis, Genesis 26 would be so impactful. Um, any, any other ones come to mind, maybe with a different sports team or, uh, yeah, I think of, um, I, I, here, here's one that has hit me recently. I think I shared it the morning we were together with your staff um, a couple of years ago. Well, a year and a half ago, I had a guy send me a text and said, um, hey, I'm going to be in town in Cleveland. The NFL sets up physicals for three days for us at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, we haven't seen each other in a long time. Can I 
can we get together? And so I said, oh, by all means, stop by the house. He played uh, in the league for um, 16 years. His three middle years were here in Cleveland, 91 to 93. And uh, he was a punter, Brian Hansen. <clears throat> and I had not seen Brian in 28 years. We, I kind of heard what he was doing and lost track. And anyway, so he shows up at my house one night, one snowy night and walks in. He didn't even sit down and he said, I, I just got to tell you, I, I came to thank you. And I felt kind of puzzled and like, oh, we had a great time together. I mean, <laughs> couldn't think any idea what this was, what was up. And he said, well, he said, when I left the game, um, I accepted a position with Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and I would not have had the courage to do that if you had not challenged me to shoulder more of the responsibilities with the ministry of the Browns. And um, so I, he said, and then the second year with FCA, they asked me to become the state director. I've been the state director now for 25 years. And so we, we had a great evening together, the, my wife and I and this uh, man. And so when he left, I said to my wife, I said, I have no idea what he was talking about, what, what we challenged him to do. And so I went up to my office and pulled out my notes from those years. And we had gotten a new coach that had basically, I'd been there 12 years, but he stopped all my ministry. He, he, he didn't give me access to the facilities. I, I no longer had a key to lock up. If I was the last guy out, I'd no longer traveled with the team. I could only see the players at a hotel the night before the game for chapel. And so I think I know who this coach was, but we yeah, won't uh, mention his name. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, Randy I'm probably glad, knows him. I, I'm glad for his impact. I, and so what happened is I must've gone to two or three players and said, it's on you guys. You're going to have to lead the ministry inside. I'll help from the outside, but I'm limited now. And, and, uh, and he did, he stepped up and he said, that's, taking that responsibility affected the rest of my career as I helped lead the ministry on my other teams. And then when I went into full-time ministry, and so I said, man, I've been angry with this coach for 20 years. I said, he sent you into ministry. I should be praising him. And, uh, and it was God's turn of events here that, that it did catapult a guy into ministry that uh, I lost my ministry, if you will, in, in some ways. And, and I took a backseat to work behind the scenes with these guys. So it's, it's stories like that that come out of ministry that you just sit back and you marvel at God's providence. You marvel at the way God works. And uh, we get too caught up in that it's all about us and what's happening to my ministry. And God, God is still so active in people's lives. And we just need, we're along for the ride. In many days, we're along for the ride. It's a great delight to see what he does. This is funny. This isn't uh this isn't any deep thought or anything, Greg, but I remember when Tom used to have the Bible studies at the Browns, and I walked into his house once, and there was a brand new couch, and I said, Tom, and the size of the guys sitting on the couch every week for the Bible study, they wore out his couches because they were so big, they were crushing his couches. I just said that was the funniest thing. Not many people in Cleveland have to worry about how supportive the couch is. That's a good one. That's a good one. Did Tom, we're going to start wrapping this up. Um, and thank you so much for giving us your time. Really appreciate it. Um, I think this is going to help a lot of people, especially some young people who maybe haven't actively discipled anyone, maybe to, to get in the, to get in the game, to, to, to step out and start helping. All, all you got to do is find somebody who's just a little, a l little bit farther behind than you, you know, Maybe they just came to faith. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, back to these, uh, you know, all the devotionals you've led to all these different sports teams. Did you ever see like people come to Christ, like as a result of those? Two? I mean, I'm sure you did, but like, is there anything that comes to mind, like a certain night where like three players like turn their life to Christ or, or, uh, like, I'm, again, I'm not sure how these devotionals go. Like if you, if you like share the gospel at the end of them and you challenge the guys to commit their lives to Christ, I'm sure you've probably done that at, at various times. Um, did you ever see like any, like really like surprising, like, you know, fruit? Yeah, there occasionally you'd see somebody come to Christ through one of the meetings, but more, most often it was in conversations with men you were developing a relationship 
after the chapel. That, that usually a chapel or a Bible study triggered something in their lives. And um, it's, it's really interesting in the, in the pro sports, probably we saw far more impact with players who had come to Christ as young men and women, but they took a left turn when they got to college and they kind of lived the wildlife and they came into the pros and it was like, see, I thought I'd be fulfilled here and I'm not. And, and then the conversations come. Uh, or you see a, a young player, I, I think of a guy, he died of pancreatic cancer a few years ago in, in his young life, but he came to the Browns as an offensive lineman. And after about two or three weeks of training camp, he, he's nervous for his, for his career if he's gonna make the team. And, and yet he notices there are three or four believers, he didn't know they're Christians, but these guys had not a worry in, the, in their life. And he said, what is with these guys? And they started to invite him to Bible study. And so one night after Bible study, he went home, got down on his knees next to his bed and asked Christ into his life. And so in, in, I guess at least for me in this arena, there were not the five guys that came forward after something or, but it was guys who were processing, man, my life really is a mess. I don't want to go in this direction. Uh, or it was a guy like Ricky Bolden who, um, we're coach said, Ricky, if you don't start performing in camp here, you're, you got a ticket back to Dallas. It's over for you. And that night he walks by the room that we have a Bible study with 10 or 20 players. And he walks in and what, what are you guys doing? And he comes to Christ that night in the Bible study or a coach that walks by the room and said, what are you, what are you guys studying? And it leads to getting to share the gospel with him. And he comes to Christ and then his wife comes to Christ. And, and there's kind of a domino effect. So it's, it's much quieter, if you will, in a sense, in, for me in, a, in that arena. Um, or I'd meet with an NBA player. I, I think of a guy they drafted one year and traded away one of our good players to get this guy. And I was so disappointed. And yet, here he shows up at chapel. And a couple of weeks later, I, I have the privilege of introducing him to Christ. And then one of his, another one of his teammates. And so it's much more on a quiet, conversational, mm-hmm. relational level with because you've got to earn their trust. They want to know what you're there for. What do you want? I don't want tickets. I, I don't. I don't want your money. I don't want your tickets. I don't want your family. I, I have something for you. And yeah, it's hard. To, it's hard time. to. It's hard to imagine what it's like for them. You know, uh, being an athlete, and especially the successful ones. You can You got to You can't trust anybody. So you you figure everybody's got some sort of motive and so just to be there and and in the midst of that and to minister out of a sincere heart and to really just want them to to know god better is 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 really really fantastic um well like i said tom you've given us so much of your time here um do you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share to our audience i would say our audience are people Christians mainly, um, who are, um, some of, some of them, some of them may be, they have fallen into that trap of the outside in approach to the spiritual life and that they're, you know, they, they're discouraged or, um, frustrated. Sometimes they, they may feel like they want to, you know, throw in the towel and, it's too hard to follow Christ, you know, that kind of thing. That's why, you know, our message is that the gospel not only brings you to Christ, but it's what grows you in Christ. And, and so we just got to, you got to keep pushing the gospel deeper and deeper into your heart. And, and that's how you change from the inside out. But do you have any, any, anything you want to share on some of the topics we discussed? Any, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, it's interesting. I was on uh, the phone this morning with another guy about my age that's in, uh, in chaplaincy. And uh, we we're talking about this issue of growth and ministry. And, and uh, we began to talk about what influenced us in ministry. And a lot of it is other men and women in the ministry around us. I, I, we're in kind of a weird ministry, if you will, with chaplaincy. There's not a lot of other places quite like it. And so we heavily depended on each other whenever we're together. What are you learning? What are you reading? What are you teaching? What, what are the trends on your teams? Um, what are the needs that you're understanding better? 
And so I think so much of ministry becomes more fruitful because of the people we hang around. I mean, I think of the influence Randy's had at our church. Um, um, just the number of people at all ages he's influenced because of his ministry. People been involved in his ministry, been on his staff team, uh, been in his committees. And, and so it's, I, I would just say to people that are learning ministry, ask questions, hang with people who are in ministry. The other thing that I've been struck with the last 10 years is I've read a lot more in the last 10 years of our real heroes of the faith um, in the last two centuries. Um, the, the older missionaries. I, th I think of the first major uh, missionary out of the United States, uh, Judge, um, I'll go blank on his name anyway. I, when he asked for his wife to marry him, he said, but I'm going to the mission field. And she said, that's great, I'm going with you. And so he went to ask her dad, can I have your daughter? Will you, will you consent to me marrying your daughter? But, but let me tell you, you'll never see her again. He said, yes, he said, yes. And he never did see her again. And they had wonderful ministry on the mission field, but it was hazardous. Most of these missionaries lost children and wives and, and the hardships. And when you read the stories of these men and their families, it just, it sits you back and say, wow, God, no wonder you use them like you did. They will go anywhere for you. And so I think learning from these men and women around us, but, but even to another extent, reading of the last two centuries of those who pioneered missions. Um, Hudson Taylor, who made 11 trips over his lifetime to China, and each trip was six months each way. He spent over five years on a ship. I hate to go five hours <laughs> on an airplane. And that was hazardous. He barely made it to the mission field usually. So... My, my sense is, is that in ministry, God meant for it to be an adventure. God meant for us to trust him in ways we'd never expect. And I think these other men and women that have gone before us are a, really a, just a jolt of reality in what it means. I can hardly wait to meet him in heaven. So, and I know Randy's read, read some of these guys too. I, I took a year, Tom, and I decided I'd read nothing but biographies for that year. And one of the biographies was Adoniram Judson, who I think is one. Of That's the, the guy I was talking about. Yeah, he yep. was the first missionary from America. Uh, I'd encourage you guys because it, it, it's it's everything. It's got doctrine. It's got Christian living. It's got uh, devotional. It, everything's included in these in these biographies. Um, and I, I think uh, you know, he challenge you like some like D. L. Moody or Spurgeon or. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Elizabeth Elliot and Jim Elliot and uh, through Gates of Splendor, all of these books, uh, Hudson Taylor is one of my favorite. And they really, uh, I feel like you have a new friend when you're done and they challenge you big time. So yeah, I love it. That's great. Um, well, Tom, if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, probably the best way is through your website, right? Yes. There's an information, um, uh, there's an information uh, address there. I forget, forget what it is. They'll, they'll see it on the website. Uh, or they could just, they're free to email me. It's tjpetersburg at gmail. tjpetersburg at gmail. And Petersburg is like the city. Okay, so. great. Um, thanks so much, Tom. It's been great being with you. Um, check out catapultministries.com, right? Dot org. Oh, it's dot org. There I go. Check out catapultministries.org. There's lots of great resources there that Tom has, has put together. And I think, has your wife worked on some of those too? She, we've just put one entry on there. She did some uh, podcasts with a friend at church that they kind of took a unique slant to it. Um, it was on some of these heroes of the faith uh, that she based it on, but then there were uh, biblical lessons that came out of their lives that she majors on. Much of it has to do with God's providence and God's sovereignty. Um, and so we've just listed one there where to find that podcast. Uh, basically, my website was originally set up pretty much for men that I minister to. And so, but we wanted to post that somewhere where people could get to it. This is kind of unique in that the woman took her interviews with Joanne and put all kinds of sound effects to it and lots of things. So it's a little unusual, um, but I, I find it just a very encouraging. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode. And remember, on your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.